My name is Amanda and I am here with... I'm Lisa, good to see you. Hello, I'm Eric, nice to be here tonight. And this is One Book, One Night, Crooked House by the mystery master herself or mystery mistress herself, uh, Agatha Christie. So if you saw our props and saw, gave you some clues, I, I will stand up and show you another little clue. I'm wearing a t-shirt with one of my favorite literary characters on it. That is Nancy Drew. Does anybody have a guess for our theme tonight? Anybody, anybody? Good chance to try the question section. It is, back to our mysterious noise, dun dun dun, May is Read a Mystery Month, so we're going to be reading the first chapters of this mystery, and hopefully it will get you hooked, and you will want to read this book in one sitting. Okay, let's go ahead and get into some of our information. So, while we're on the topic of mysteries, another one you might want to pick up is something that's a bit more modern. It's The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Um, and the, the clue is in the title. This is the story of a man who has to solve Evelyn's murder, and he has to keep reliving that same night over and over again until he solves the murder. But if he doesn't do it in time, he could become the next victim. Uh, it's a really fun twisty turny uh, kind of Groundhog, Groundhog's Day meets Agatha Christie uh, twist to it. I, this is a fun one. Great mystery to pick up that's a, a little more modern than this Agatha. And I will say I've read this one as well, Lisa. This is a great one and you know I love audiobooks, <laughs> but this is one I feel like you're going to want to get uh, the actual book because I had to flip back and forth a lot and be like, wait, what happened? And uh, so it is a great mystery and it really all does come together very beautifully mm -hmm. in the end. And we do have it in all the editions that you would expect in the catalog. We have it regular print, large print, audiobook, all of the above. So, yay. So if you do want to, if you want to listen along and then get the the actual the ebook or the physical book, you can do that. Okay, let's start this evening with a poll question. So a poll is going to pop up on your screen. Okay, so our poll question is. Have you ever read any books by Agatha Christie or seen any of the movie adaptations? Which is the lovely thing is there are tons of good movie adaptations of these as well, spanning decades and decades. The answers could be yes, no, or not yet, but I do want to. So let's go ahead and it looks like we have, most people have voted. We'll give about one more second here. Okay, very good. And we have, let's see the results. Okay, so we have about 67% said yes, you have. So maybe in the uh, question section, you can tell us which books you've read or which books you've enjoyed by Agatha Christie or which movie adaptations. And 33% said not yet, but I want to. So this is a good start on getting around to reading that Agatha Christie. Mm -hmm. And Eric, why don't you tell us about the discussion question for tonight? All right, so, uh... Most of Agatha Christie books written between 1939 and 1945 avoid mentioning World War II. It wasn't until the 1948 Poirot story taken at the flood in the 1949 Crooked House, which we're looking at tonight, that she sets characters in the context of the war. We would like to know why you guys think she avoided this topic. An interesting discussion question. So we are going to circle back around and get your responses at the end of the uh, session. You can type those in at any time, though. Let's go ahead and turn our cameras off and get right into this story. I first came to know Sophia Leonides in Egypt towards the end of the war. She held a fairly high administrative post in one of the foreign office departments out there. I knew her first in an official capacity, and I soon appreciated the efficiency that had brought her to the position she held, in spite of her youth. She was, at that time, just 22. Besides being extremely easy to look at, she had a clear mind and a dry sense of humor that I found very delightful. We became friends. She was a person whom it was extraordinarily easy to talk to and we enjoyed our dinners and occasional dances very much. All this I knew. It was not until I was ordered east 
at the close of the European war that I knew something else, that I loved Sophia and that I wanted to marry her. We were dining at Shepherd's when I made this discovery. Sophia asked me what I was thinking about. I replied truthfully, you. I see, she said, and she sounded as though she did see. We may not meet again for a couple of years, I said. I don't know when I shall get back to England, but as soon as I do get back, the first thing I shall do will be to come and see you and ask you to marry me. Ich lernte Sophia Leonides während des Krieges in Ägypten kennen. Sie hatte einen recht hohen Verwaltungsposten in einer der dortigen Abteilungen des Außenministeriums inne. Ich hatte zunächst die dienstlich mit ihr zu tun und konnte mich schon bald von, der, von ihr, der Tüchtigkeit überzeugen, die ihr trotz ihrer Jugend, sie war zu dem Zeitpunkt erst 22, ihre Position verschafft hatte. Abgesehen davon, dass sie ein außerordentliches Vergnügen für das Auge darstellte, besaß sie einen klaren Verstand und einen trockenen Humor, was ich sehr reizvoll fand. Wir wurden Freunde. Sie war ein Mensch, mit dem man sich ungewöhnlich gut unterhalten konnte. Wir genossen unsere Dinär und gelegentliche Tanze mit einem Ungemein. Das alles war mir bekannt, erst als, als ich gegen Ende des Krieges in Europa in den Osten versetzt wurde, erkannte ich etwas anderes, dass ich Sophia liebte und dass ich sie heiraten wollte. Wir dinierten gerade im Shepherd Hotel, als ich diese Entdeckung machte. Sophia fragte mich, woran ich dachte. Ich antwortete wahrheitsgemäß, sie. Ich verstehe, sagte sie, und es klang so, als ob es wirklich stimmte. Kann sein, dass wir uns die nächsten paar Jahre nicht sehen, sagte ich. Ich weiß nicht, wann ich nach England zurückkommen werde, aber wenn ich erst mal wieder da bin, werde ich als allererstes zu, zu Ihnen kommen und Sie bitten, meine Frau zu werden. Conocí a Sofía Leonidis en Egipto. Cuando acabó la guerra, ocupaba, ocupaba un puesto administrativo bastante importante en uno de los departamentos de la delegación del Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores en, en el Cairo. La conocí primero por su cargo oficial y pronto pude apreciar la eficiencia que le había llevado hasta aquel puesto, a pesar de su juventud. En aquella época solo contaba 22 años. Además de una experiencia muy agradable, tenía la mente clara y un afilado sentido de humor que me encantaba. Nos hicimos amigos. Resultaba muy fácil hablar con ella y disfrutamos mucho las veces que salimos juntos a cenar o a bailar. Todo esto ya lo sabía. Lo que no supe hasta que me destinaron a Oriente, cuando acabó la guerra europea, fue que amaba a Sofía y que quería casarme con ella. Estábamos cenando en Shepherds cuando fui consciente, consciente de ello. Sofía me preguntó en qué estaba pensando. Yo le dije la verdad. En ti. Comprendo, respondió, y pareció como si fuera sincera. Puede que nos vemos en un par de años, añadí. No sé cuándo volveré a Inglaterra, pero cuando lo haga, lo primero que haré será ir a verte para pedirte que te casas conmigo. I do understand, Charles. And I like your funny way of doing things. And you may come and see me when you, when you come back, if you still want to. It was my turn to interrupt. There's no doubt about that. There's always doubt about everything, Charles. There may always be some incalculable factor that upsets the apple cart. For one thing, you don't know much about me, do you? I don't even know where you live in England. I live at Swinley Dean. She added softly in a musing voice, in a little crooked house. I must have looked slightly startled, for she seemed amused and explained by elaborating the quotation, and they all lived together in a little crooked house. That's us. Not really such a little house either, but definitely crooked running to gables and 
half timbering. Ich begreife durchaus, Charles, und ich mag deine ulkige Art, Dinge zu tun und zu sagen. Du darfst mich gern besuchen, wenn du wieder im Land bist. Wenn du mich dann noch, jetzt war es an mir, sie zu unterbrechen, daran besteht kein Zweifel. Es besteht immer an allem ein Zweifel, Charles. Es kann immer ein unkalkulierbarer Faktor eintreten, der alles über den Haufen wirft. Zunächst einmal weißt du nicht mehr viel, mich, nicht, weißt du nicht viel über mich, stimmt's? Ich weiß nicht einmal, wo du in England wohnst. Ich wohne in Swinley Dean. Mit verträumter Stimme fügt sie leise hinzu. In einem kleinen, krummen Haus. Ich muss ein verdutztes Gesicht gemacht haben, denn sie wirkte belustigt und zitierte zur Erklärung ein etwas längeres Stück mit des bekannten Kinderreims. Und sie lebten allesamt in einem kleinen, krummen Haus. Das trifft oft uns zu, obwohl das Haus so klein nun auch wieder nicht ist. Aber in Schiedenkrumm scheut nicht mal vor Giebeln und Fachwerk zurück. No entiendo, Charles. Y me gusta tu manera de hacer las cosas. Me tocó a mí el tono de interrumpirla. Sobre eso no tengas ninguna duda. Siempre hay dudas, Charles. Puede haber factores imprevistos que lo echen todo a rodar. Para empezar, no sabes mucho sobre mí, ¿verdad? Ni siquiera sé dónde vives en Inglaterra. Vivo en Swinley Bean. Sofía añadió con suavedad en un murmullo. murmullo en una casita torcida. Debe demostrar mi asombro porque ella pareció divertida y se explicó com comple completando la cita. Y todos vivieron juntos en una casita torcida. Así somos nosotros. No es que la casa sea pequeña, pero estás torcida, llena de arcos ovijales y vigas de madera. Okay, it is time for our next poll question. So we just met a couple who is on the brink of, well, maybe on the brink of or already fallen in love, uh, but they are also on the brink of separation. So what do you think of Charles and Sophia? Do they make a believable couple or what do you think? You can answer yes, no, it's too early to tell. And if you have a strong opinion, you can let us know in the question section. You can say no because war brings us together and takes us apart. Or you could say yes because I'm a romantic and I see the glass half full. Okay, we have got actually all of our votes in. So let's go ahead and see the results here. Okay, and it looks like we do not have a lot of romantics out there in the audience because we've got 50% no <laughs> and 50% it's too early to tell. Well, I'll say that's a glass half full maybe. That's a cautiously optimistic. It may be too early to tell because we don't know too much about the characters yet. So let's keep on reading and find out a little bit more. Well, before we continue reading, don't forget our wonderful resource that is available to anyone with a library card through the library hoopla. You know, it has movies that you can watch and it has these great, so, uh, this great selection that you can see here of mystery movies or even some Agatha Christie stories. Very cool. And it has books, audio books and music and other things as well. Hoopla, amazing. It's awesome. Check it out. It was over two years before I returned to England. They were not easy years. I wrote to Sophia and heard from her fairly frequently. Her letters, like mine, were not love letters. They were letters written to each other by close friends. They dealt with ideas and thoughts and with comments on the daily trend of life. Yet I know that as far as I was concerned, and I believed as far as Sophia was concerned too, our feelings for each other grew and strengthened. I returned to England on a soft gray day in September. The leaves on the trees were golden in the evening light. There were playful gusts of wind. From the, ear, from the airfield, I sent a telegram to Sophia. Just arrived back. Will you dine this evening? Mario's, nine o'clock. Charles. A telegram from 
Sophia reached me at six o'clock at my father's house. It said, we'll be at Mario's at nine o'clock. Sophia. Es sollten über zwei Jahre vergehen, bevor ich nach England zurückkehrte. Es waren keine leichten Jahre. Ich schrieb Sophia und hörte von ihr ziemlich regelmäßig. Ihre Briefe waren, ebenso wie meine, keine Liebes Liebesbriefe. Es waren Briefe, wie sich, gute, wie sich gute Freunde schreiben. Sie handelten von Einfällen und Gedanken und alltäglichen Begebenheiten. Dennoch weiß ich, dass, was mich und, wie ich annahm, auch Sophia betraf, unsere Gefühle füreinander stetig wuchsen und an Kraft gewannen. Es war ein milder Grautag im September, als ich, als ich nach England zurückkehrte. Die Blätter an den Bäumen leuchteten gold im Abendlicht. Der Wind spielte in Böen damit. Vom Flugplatz aus schickte ich Sophia ein Telegramm. Di, 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 Soeben gelandet. Dinner, heute, Marius, 21 Uhr, Charles. Sophias telegrafische Antwort erreichte mich um sechs im Post meines Vaters. Sie lautete, di, 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 Habían pasado más de dos años cuando volví a, la, a Inglaterra. No fueron fáciles. Escribía a Sofía y con frecuencia recibía cartas suyas. Estas, al igual que las mías, no eran cartas de amor, sino misivas escritas por unos buenos amigos que exponen sus ideas y pensamientos y comentan en su día a día. Sin embargo, por lo que a mí respectaba, y creo que a Sofía le ocurría lo mismo, lo que sentíamos el uno hacia el otro creció y se hizo más fuerte. Regresé a Inglaterra un apacible y gris día de septiembre. Las hojas de los árboles parecían de oro a la luz del atardecer y el viento soplaba juguetón. Desde el aeropuerto envié un telegrama a Sofía. Acabo de llegar. ¿Tienes conmigo esta noche en Marios a las nueve? Charles. A las seis recibí un telegrama suyo en casa de mi padre. Decía así. Estaré en Marios a las nueve. Sofía. It, it is always a shock to meet again someone whom you have not seen for a long time, but who has been very much present in your mind during that period. When at last Sophia came through the swing doors, our meeting seemed completely unreal. She was wearing black, and that, in some curious way, startled me. Most other women were wearing black, but I got it into my head that it was definitely mourning. And it surprised me that Sophia should be the kind of person who did wear black, even for a near relative. Then quite suddenly, as the waiter placed coffee on the table and retired bowing, everything swung into focus. Here were Sophia and I sitting together as so often before at a small table in a restaurant. The years of our separation might never have been. Es ist immer ein gewisser Schock, jemanden wieder zu begegnen, den man lange nicht gesehen hat, der einem aber während dieser Zeit höchst gegenwärtig war. Als Sophia endlich durch die Schwingtür trat, kam mir, kam mir unser Zusammentreffen vollkommen irreal vor. Sie trug schwarz und diese Tatsache überrumpelte mich kurioserweise. Zwar trugen die meisten anderen Frauen, anwesenden Frauen ebenfalls schwarz, aber ich war mir irgendwie sicher, dass es bei ihr eindeutig um Trauerkleidung war. Und es überraschte mich, dass Sophia die Sorte Mensch sein sollte, die tatsächlich Trauer trug und sei es auch für einen nahen Verwandten. Dann ganz plötzlich, als der Kellner den Kaffee an den Tisch brachte und sich mit einer Verbeugung zurückzog, rückte sich alles zurecht. Da saßen Sophia und ich, wie schon zahllose Mal zuvor, an einem kleinen Tisch in einem Restaurant. Mit einem Schlag waren die Jahre unserer Trennung wie weggewischt. 
Siempre produce impresión encontrarse de nuevo con una persona a quien no se ha visto desde hace mucho y que, sin embargo, ha estado muy presente en nuestra imaginación. Cuando Sofía per apareció por la puerta girator giratoria, nuestro encuentro se alejó de la realidad. Iba vestido de negro y eso, por alguna extraña razón, me sobresaltó. La mayoría de las mujeres llevaban vestidos negros, pero lo suyo era luto, y me, y me sorprendió que fuese de las personas que llevan luto, aunque lo hiciera por un parien pariente próximo. Y entonces, de pronto, cuando el camarero dejaba el café en la mesa y, se y ya se re retiraba con una inclinación, las aguas volvieron a su cauce. Allí estábamos, juntos Sofía y yo, como tantas otras veces, sentados ante una mesa en un restaurante. Era como si nunca hubieran ex ex existido los años de separación. We smiled at each other. Darling, I said. And then, how soon will you marry me? Her smile died. The something, whatever it was, was back. I don't know, she said. I'm not sure, Charles, that I can ever marry you. But Sophia, why not? Is it because you feel I'm a stranger? Do you want time to get used to me again? Is there someone else? No, I broke off. I'm a fool. It's none of those things. No, it isn't, she shook her head. I waited. She said in a low voice, it's my grandfather's death. Your grandfather's death? But why? What earthly difference can that make? You don't mean, surely you can't imagine. Is it money? Hasn't he left any? But surely, dearest, it isn't money. She gave a fleeting smile. I think you'd be quite willing to take me in my shift as the old saying goes, and grandfather never lost any money in his life. Then what is it? It's just his death. You see, I think Charles, he didn't just die. I think he may have been killed. I stared at her. The suspicions may be quite unjustified, but putting that aside, Supposing they are justified, how does that affect you and me? It might under certain circumstances. You're in the diplomatic service. They're rather particular about wives. No, please, don't say all the things that you're bursting to say. You're bound to say them. And I believe you really think them, and theoretically, I quite agree with them. But I'm proud. I'm devilishly proud. I want our marriage to be a good thing for everyone. I don't want to represent one half of a sacrifice for love. And as I say, it may be all right. You mean the doctor may have made a mistake? Even if he hasn't made a mistake, it won't matter. So long as the right person kills him. Liebling, sagte ich. Und dann, wie weit wirst du mich heiraten? Ihr Lächeln, Lächeln starb. Dieses Etwas, das immer es sein mochte, war wieder da. Ich weiß nicht, sagte sie. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, Charles, ob ich dich überhaupt jemals heiraten kann. Aber Sophia, warum denn nicht? Liegt es daran, dass ich dir fremd vorkomme? Brauchst du Zeit, um dich wieder an mich zu gewöhnen? Gibt es einen anderen? Na, nein, ich brach ab. Ich bin ein Idiot, es ist nichts von all dem. Nein, du hast recht. Sie schüttelte den Kopf und schwieg einen Moment. Dann sagte sie mit leiser Stimme, es liegt am Tod meines Großvaters. Am Tod deines Großvaters? Aber wieso? Was in aller Welt kann sich dadurch ändern? Du meinst doch nicht etwa. Du kannst doch unmöglich. Geht es ums Geld? Hat er dir nichts hinterlassen? Aber liebste du? Es geht nicht um Geld, sie lächelte flüchtig. 
Ich glaube, du wärst durchaus bereit, mich im Hemd zu nehmen, wie man früher zu, zu, zu sagen pflegte. Und Geld hat Großvater in seinem ganzen Leben nicht verloren. Es ist einfach sein Tod als solcher. Als solcher. Verstehst du, Charles? Ich glaube, dass er nicht einfach so gestorben ist. Ich glaube, möglicherweise wurde er getötet. Ich starte sie an. Der Verdacht konnte sich als vollkommen unberechtigt erweisen. Aber selbst wenn dem nicht so wäre, selbst wenn sich der Verdacht bestätigen sollte, inwiefern tangiert es dich und mich? Was könnte es unter bestimmten Umständen? Du bist im auswärtigen Dienst. Die Burschen sind ziemlich eigen, was Ehefrauen anbelangt. Nein, bitte sprich sie nicht aus, die ganzen Dinge, die du jetzt unbedingt sagen möchtest. Du fühlst dich verpflichtet, sie, sie zu sagen. Und ich glaube dir, dass du sie auch so meinst. Und theoretisch bin ich völlig deiner Meinung, aber ich bin stolz. Ich bin stolz wie Lucifer. Ich will, dass unsere Heirat an jedermanns Augen ein Gutes ist. Ich will nicht die bessere Hälfte eines Opfers so aus Liebe darstellen. Und wie ich schon sagte, es könnte alles gut werden. Du meinst, der Arzt könnte sich geirrt haben? Selbst wenn er sich nicht geirrt hat, braucht es keine Rolle zu spielen, solange ihn die richtige Person getötet hat. Sonreímos. Querida, dije y añadí, ¿cuándo, ¿cuándo te casarás conmigo? Su sonrisa se desvaneció. Allí estaba otra vez aquello. Fuera lo que fuese. No sé, Charles. No estoy segura de que pueda casarme contigo. Pero, Sofía, ¿por qué no? ¿Es que te parezco un extraño? ¿Necesitas tiempo para acostumbrarte a mí? ¿Hay alguien más? No, me caí de repente. Soy un estúpido. No es por nada de esto. No tienes, no, tienes razón. Negó con la cabeza. Yo esperé. Ella añadió en voz baja, es por la muerte de mi abuelo. ¿La muerte de tu abuelo? ¿Por qué? ¿Qué diferencia hay en que haya muerto tu abuelo? No querrás decir que... No imaginarás que... ¿Es por dinero? Es que no ha dejado dinero. Oh, querida mía, comprenderás que... No es cuestión de dinero. Me dirijo una sonrisa rápida. Creo que no tendrías inconveniente en cargar conmigo solo con lo puesto. Además, mi abuelo jamás tuvo problemas de dinero. Entonces, ¿qué ocurre? Es su muerte en sí. Verás, Charles, no es el hecho de que haya muerto. Creo que quizá lo hayan matado. La miré atónito. Puede que sus sospechas sean del todo injustificadas, pero dejando esto aparte y suponiendo que haya un motivo, ¿qué tiene que ver eso con nosotros? Puede tenerlo según las circunstancias. Tú estás en el cuerpo diplomático y ya sabes que son exigentes respecto a las esposas. No, por favor, no digas lo que estás pensando. ¿Crees que estás obligado a decirlo? Sé lo que sientes y, en teoría, estoy de acuerdo, pero soy terriblemente orgullosa. Quiero que nos, nuestro matrimonio sea algo bueno, conveniente para los dos, y no se convierta en un sacrificio de amor. Y, como te digo, puede que todo salga bien. ¿Quieres decir que quizá el médico se haya equivocado? Aunque no se haya equivocado, no importa, con tal de que el asesino sea quien debe ser. ¿Es as bad as that, then? I think so. Do you see a man sitting at a table by the door all alone? Rather a nice looking, stolid ex army type? Yes. He was on Swinley Dean platform this evening when I got into the train. You mean he's followed you here? Yes, I think we're all, how does one put it? Under observation. They more or less hinted 
that we'd all better not leave the house. But I was determined to see you. Her small square chin shot out pugnaciously. I got out of the bathroom window and shinned down the water pipe, darling. But the police are very efficient. And of course, there was the telegram I sent you. Well, never mind. We're here together. But from now on, we both got to play a lone hand. She paused and then added, unfortunately, there's no doubt about our loving each other. No doubt at all, I said. And don't say unfortunately. You and I have survived a world war. We've had plenty of near escapes from sudden death. And I don't see why the sudden death of just one old man. How old was he, by the way? 87. Of course, it was in the times. If you ask me, he just died of old age. And any self-respecting GP would accept the fact. If you'd known my grandfather, said Sophia, you'd have been surprised at his dying of anything. So schlimm steht es also? Ich fürchte ja. Siehst du den Mann, der ganz allein an dem Tisch neben der Tür sitzt? Tipp vorzeigbarer, stur, korrekter Ex-Soldat? Ja. Er stand heute Abend auf dem Bahnsteig, als ich in Swinley Dean in den Zug gestiegen bin. Du meinst, er ist dir hierher gefolgt? Ja, ich, ich glaube, wir, wie sagt man das, stehen alle unter Beobachtung. Die Beamten haben mehr oder weniger angedeutet, dass wir besser daran täten, das Haus nicht zu verlassen. Aber ich war fest entschlossen, dich zu treffen. Sie streckte ihr kleines, kantiges Kinn streitbar vor. Ich bin durchs Badezimmerfenster gestiegen und das Ballrohr runtergeklettert. Liebling, aber die Polizei ist sehr tüchtig und natürlich war da noch das Telegramm, das ich dir geschickt hatte. Tja, egal. Wir sind hier zusammen, aber von nun an müssen wir beide einen Alleingang weitermachen. Sie schwieg kurz und fügte dann hinzu. Unglücklicherweise besteht kein Zweifel daran, dass wir uns lieben. Nicht der Geringste, sagte ich, und sag nicht unglücklicherweise. Du und ich haben einen Weltkrieg überlebt. Es, wir sind etliche Male haarscharf an einem plötzlichen Tod vorbeigeschwand. Und ich sehe nicht ein, warum der plötzliche Tod eines alten Mannes, apropos, wie alt war er eigentlich? 87, natürlich, es stand ja in der Times. Wenn du mich fragst, ist er ganz einfach an Altersschwäche gestorben und jeder Hausarzt, der was auf sich hält, würde diese Tatsache akzeptieren. Wenn du meinen Großvater gekannt hättest, sagte Sophia, dann wärst du überrascht, dass ihn überhaupt etwas umbringen konnte. Tan grave es. Eso creo. Ves a aquel hombre que está sentado cerca de la puerta? Un tipo guapo, tranquilo, con aspecto de militar retirado? Sí. Estaba en, en el andén de Swinney Dean cuando he cogido el tren. ¿Quieres decir que te ha seguido hasta aquí? Sí. Creo que estamos todos, ¿cómo se dice? Bajo vigilancia. Dieron a entender que haríamos bien en no dejar la casa. Pero yo tenía que verte. Su pequeña barbilla cuadrada se adelantó. He salido por la ventana del cuarto de baño y me he deslizado por el tubo del desagüe. Querida. Aunque los policías son muy eficientes. Y además está el telegrama que te he mandado. Bueno, no importa. Estamos aquí, juntos. Pero de ahora en adelante tendremos que actuar por separado. Hizo una pausa y añadió, por desgracia, no hay duda de que nos queremos. No hay la menor, no hay la menor duda. Y no digas, por desgracia. Hemos sobrevivido una guerra mundial. Nos hemos librado milagrosamente de una muerte repentina en muchas ocasiones. Y no veo por qué la muerte de un anciano, por cierto, ¿qué edad tenía? 87 años. Sí, es cierto, lo decía The Times. Si quieres que te diga lo que pienso, 
Creo que murió de viejo y cualquier médico respetable lo aceptaría. Okay, let's get to our next poll question. So we have found out who has been murdered and that there has, well, there has been potentially a murder. So think Sophia. But let's ask a question about, we've heard about the Crooked House and that a murder may have happened there, we think happened there. What kind of atmosphere do you think, or do you anticipate the house having? Um, a lot of times the setting is just important as the action in these mystery novels and these mystery stories. So what do you think? Do you think it will be creepy, the Crooked House? Does it have romantic tensions? Is it ominous? Uh, maybe there's some decadence there. It's uh, maybe an old family with money. Or if there is another, what do you think? You can tell us in the question section. And uh, Eric and uh, Eric and Lisa, why don't you tell us what do you think the Crooked House will be like? I don't know. From that from that mother goose rhyme there about the Crooked House, I'm I'm definitely getting some creepy ominous vibes. So I think I'll take those two options. I, I think so too. I'm feeling a little creepy the way Sophia said the rhyme in that <laughs> conversation. So I, I'm I'm feeling some creepy tensions there. What are you thinking, Eric? Yeah, I'm, I'm right in line with you guys. I can't picture this place as being anything other but spooky. It sounds like the family might have some creepy tendencies too with this, uh, with mm -hmm. this murder on our hands. So, you know, I think that might be something going on. Well, let's see what the audience said here. Okay, so we're... We are getting, uh, well, you guys are getting a little less creepy than us, and you are getting some more ominous, ominous vibes. So maybe the foreboding, the system of foreboding is there hanging over the house, and a feeling of decadence. So uh, she did describe it as not small, so maybe it is ornate and beautiful and um, just under a rain cloud or a shadow at this, at this current time of murder, of murder. <laughs> so let's go ahead and find out a little bit more about this situation. So we have, uh, if you want to do learn how to do some sleuthing of your own, or if you want to learn how to write like Agatha, uh, we have some great classes available through our universal class service. Um, there's a mystery writing course. It's a pretty extensive one. Uh, it, uh, it's a nine hour course. It's, it's all self-paced. It's participatory. Um, you can kind of choose how much you interact with it and when. Uh, but it's a fun little course on on getting your mystery novel off the ground. Maybe prep that for NaNoWriMo for, for November. Or if you want to get more into the nitty gritty of it, there's courses on criminology basics, haunted places. I think there was one on ghost hunting as well. I, so it, it hits, it, it checks all those those boxes for uh, if you wanted to have a little a little Agatha Poirot flavored. Uh, little continuing education jaunt there. So check those out on you on our website through Universal Class. You can get to it by going to our homepage slash research slash online learning and find out about Universal Class and a bunch of other uh, continuing education options that we have available. Thanks Lisa, those sound really cool. Okay, let's jump back into the story. Oh, actually, actually, we have come to the end of the reading portion, and now it's time to get some feedback. So I'm going to invite uh, Eric and Lisa and myself back on camera, and let's get into our discussion question. So everybody, if you have not had a chance, please find that question section so you can give us your feedback. Okay, Eric, do you want to review the discussion question with us? Definitely. So most of Agatha Christie books written between 1939 and 1945 avoid mentioning World War II. It wasn't until the 1948 Poirot story taken at the flood and the 1949 Crooked House that she selects characters in the context of the war. Why do you think she avoided the topic? And 1939 to 45 is the entire duration of the war. Just and when okay. she did most of her writing, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. For what big time period. Yeah. Um, so as you are looking at your control panels, remember there is that question section that you can submit questions in. We can we will read aloud your answers and get the discussion going. 
I am, uh, if anybody does not know, Agatha Christie lived a bit of a mysterious life herself. She had, a, I think, a nine or 11 day period where she went missing and it was a kind of open investigation. There's some really good resources. I think there's a graphic novel we have in the catalog about it. If you want to read her life. So she was not just writing mysteries. She was living she them. Was living them. Uh, She's a, she's a method, method writer, I suppose. <laughs> uh, the case was later resolved with a little bit of a brushing under the rug, I believe. Um, well, while we're waiting for some of our feedback from our viewers, Eric and Lisa, what do you think about this, this discussion question? I, I mean, I do think it's interesting considering how much she wrote during that period and how World War II obviously permeated every aspect of society and culture and everything that was happening there. So I I did find it a little bit interesting that it didn't play a role at all. Like it wasn't even remotely touched on in, in any of those books. So I it did stand out to me. Um, part of it might be that uh, the very you know, stiff upper lip, you know, keeping calm and carrying on and making day. that tangent of removing, removing that horrible part of reality from the, the fantasy escape of diving into this mystery. I, uh, I tend to agree with that if, for both the writer and probably the audience. Uh, you know, I think there probably is that sense of maybe escapism there in that, you know, I don't want to write about this, I'm living it, but the audience doesn't want to read about this. I mean, they just want a sweet little murder and not, not all this war <laughs> stuff. But, well. <laughs> but I think I think there is that sense. And, you know, keep in mind, Agatha Christie, like many of her generation, had already survived a world war. And it, you know, it just could have been a coping mechanism in, mm -hmm. in that, she, you know, she was just not not writing about that. So, yeah. That's my thoughts too. I think she was, you know, why write about it when we're living it? Let's do something that so you can light and fluffy like murder. Yeah, yeah. Let's a little, a little. Well, that is an escape, but very. Uh, I think the other thing, another interesting thing, and I actually have not researched this, would be how many books of at that time were. I mean, how many books were set in the war? Because as we know, it is historical fiction being the behemoth genre that it is and i know some of your readers out there are historical fiction fans because i can see i can see uh that that um the behemoth that it is we have so many books even today you know 80 years later set in world war ii but at the time how many books like like thrillers espionage or just you know books were set with that war setting and i imagine even though it was a prolific time with for her i imagine publishing slowed down quite a bit during during the war again oh, i would man. have to do the research on that but i would imagine that is um has something to do with it so well we are maybe uh our audience doesn't have a lot of thoughts on this topic which is an interesting one but let us know if you have a favorite agatha christie book or movie adaptation of course they are still just like jane austen they are still revisited generally and you know liberally generously and liberally from hollywood and the bbc and production and television there's a lot of great ones out there maybe you are an Al albert finney poirot maybe you are a david Suchet poirot let us know your thoughts in the comment section um any or any books uh that you have read by or maybe by. you're gonna go with the knives out adaptation mm. Ooh, that was a great one Okay, we're getting some comments coming in. Loving that. Loving that. Uh, I, uh, let's see. Okay, oops, I just popped back into the, the question section. Let me pop it back out. Okay, so uh, one of our readers or one of our viewers does agree with us that they maybe needed to escape from reality of the war. I think that is probably very prevalent. You know, it's just something you maybe if you're living, you don't want to read about. The other thing is, this is a weird thing to say, but you don't know how the war is going to end so you know you don't want to incriminate yourself at all maybe or anything like that uh we also have a murder on the orient express is something that uh some uh, one of our favorites out there I, and it looks like we uh, have another one for and then there was none mentioned in the chat section also very good i kind of find those uh we do those are kind of the inverse books of each other they have an interesting structure uh, I do want to do a shout out again to Hoopla. If you, if we have any um, Downton Abbey fans in the audience, 
you may remember Dan Stevens, who played Cousin Matthew. He uh, reads, he narrates quite a few of the Agatha Christie books we have on Hoopla. Beautiful, he was made for that role. It is wonderful. And it is hard when you have the laundry list of characters to keep them straight in an audiobook. He really does a good job of making them all distinct and enjoyable and you, you follow along very well. So if you are interested in reading Murder on the Orient Express, or, um, and then there were none, I would check that out. I think there also is uh, Kenneth Branagh because he's redoing those movies. He has since released some audiobook versions. If you're a fan there, you might enjoy that. Um, Lisa and Eric, do you have a, a favorite Agatha Christie, uh, a favorite, a, a go-to? Uh, you know, I obviously don't have a favorite, but I do find that although I enjoy reading them, I really like the filmed adaptations and the different spin that I see from the various adaptations on it. So I, I, I've been enjoying those, especially the Hoopla ones, because free. <laughs> okay, well, that's right. Yeah. I will say um, there's so many good ones, too, and they do really span so many, um, so many different. I mean, she was writing for many decades. So, you, you know, you span, you do have starting in the early 30s all the way up, I think, through the 50s maybe i could be wrong on that we we can read it we can always read so, it. We can... apparently crooked house was her personal favorite oh this was her pet story interesting if um if people are looking for a more of a light-hearted romp you can check out the tommy and tuppence series they are a kind of a pair of it's almost like she really it's 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 kind of like the written version of if anybody likes the uh the thin man the myrna loy and william powell kind of screwball kind of solving and oh look at this whoops we've got ourselves in a mess with a little less like maybe not so much murder but still some like still some suspense and tension you might want to check out there's a series of four books with uh the characters are tommy and tuppence and they are the uh a male and female kind of erstwhile i don't want to say spies but they kind of get themselves into some situations so if you're looking for something a little lighthearted in the mystery genre you might want to check that one out but we are going to read uh just like in some of her books the and then there were none there is that full nursery rhyme so we do want to leave you before we leave let's fast forward to that so you can get the effect of that let's go ahead and turn off our cameras and finish that out there was a crooked man and he went a crooked mile he found a crooked sixpence beside a crooked style he had a crooked cat which caught a crooked mouse and they all lived together in a little crooked house war einmal ein krummer mann der lief ne krumme stund er fand nen krummen pfennig nicht eckig und nicht rund er hat ne krumme katze die fing ne krumme maus und sie lebten allesamt in einem kleinen krummen haus era se un hombre hombre torcido que anduvo una milla torcida encontró seis peniques torcidos junto a un portillo torcido tenía un gato torcido que cogió un ratón torcido y todos vivieron juntos en una casita torcida Okay, so that gives us a little, I do feel like we have that ominous vibe. So maybe I do agree with you, audience. That's giving me some uh, ominous feelings for that crooked house. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. We are going to be back next month, two times in the month of July and two times in the month of June with one book, one night. And those are going to be, we're going to have an adult one and one for all ages. Eric is going to put the link for the next program in the chat section on June 4th at 6.30. We are going to be reading the beloved children's classic, uh, Charlotte's Web. We are going to be reading that in English and in Spanish. We're going to be introducing some new readers, so it is going to be a great opportunity to join us. If you do have any questions about using the library card, any of those great databases, including Hoopla and Universal Class that we talked about tonight, you can always give us a call at 813 273-3652, or you can contact us at hcplc.org slash contact. If you want to find out more great events, including our summer events that are going on, please check out our full calendar of events at hcplc.org slash events. And if you would love to share a library story with us, we would love to hear it from you. Tonight we were talking about mystery stories. We'll take all sorts of library stories, romances, heartwarming, mysteries, library mysteries, we'll take it all. You can share those stories at hcplc.org slash about slash stories. Okay, I'm going to give one final run to the question section, and then we are going to close for the evening. So 
Oh, we do have somebody who already has it on reserve. So we are hoping you enjoy that book and that you join us next month for Charlotte's Web. And we will be following later in the month with Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Everybody have a wonderful Friday night and we will see you the next time. Bye. Bye.